welcome to Think Big with Dan and Cosman. Our guest today is John Brady, CEO of Midtown Athletics. I guess, John, if you want to introduce yourself and I guess kind of how you got into your current role. Yeah, sure. Um, I, hi, my name's John. I'm the uh, yeah, CEO, president of Midtown Athletic Clubs uh, based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, as you can tell, my accent is not the Midwest, uh, the typical Midwest accent. I'm from New Zealand originally, um, have lived and worked uh, in, in Europe as well, and um, uh, ended up in Chicago about 10 years ago when I was approached to come and run uh, Midtown Athletic Clubs and elevate that uh, those clubs to a premium uh, health club model. So. so how did you get started working in the health and fitness space? Um, uh, well, I, I started when I was about 16. I started uh, work as a Group X instructor. I was uh, back in the day when uh, everyone was still doing aerobics, uh, and that's what it was called. So I was uh, I, I needed a way to keep fit uh, for sport between um, seasons, and I I hated long distance running. I played uh, I played soccer at a fairly high level in New Zealand, and I just didn't like long distance running. It was just boring. So I started doing aerobics just because it was seemed like it was fun. Um, and ended up teaching classes and, and loved it. And then um, over over time, went away, you know, obviously stopped doing that in my early 20s when I started working and uh, and then have come full circle in the last, I guess, 20 years, came back to the health and fitness sector after working in education and in sports management uh, for a long time, uh, running professional sports teams, and then came back in 2003, 2004, back in the health and fitness sector, um, this time not as a Group X instructor, but um, back in at a more uh, senior level, but still enjoy uh, getting out and uh, jumping around in a, in a Group X class from time to time. Awesome. So I guess, how did you make the transition and when did you move to the US, New Zealand? So um, I moved from New Zealand. I was running a professional rugby team in New Zealand um, back in uh, 98, through 2003 um and at that at that time it was the dawn of professionalism within rugby so rugby had been an amateur sport became professional at the high, highest level uh so there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of change uh change management we went through with that um so i was involved in that with new zealand rugby and then um met my now wife in new zealand who's british um and uh she was with me in new zealand for a number of years and and then wanted to move back to the UK. Um, timing was right for me to take a break uh, from professional sport. And so we moved to London um, back in 2003, I guess it was. And um, and then uh, we, you know, I, I started looking at what would I, what I, what I want to do next. And um, the health club, premium health club sector had just started to blow up in the UK at that time. So, that you know, I initially went back into it thinking it would be a one-year temporary um, re resolution for getting paid <laughs> for doing some work, um, and and anticipated going back into sport after that year, but um, just loved it, loved the people that were involved with it, rekindled my enthusiasm for um, helping others, which I think through professional sport I'd sort of lost that flame so to speak, that passion, um, which is what drove me into education in the first place uh, out of college. And so it was really, for me, it was like, okay, well, we're really making a difference here, really able to help people be better versions of themselves. So um, sort of lit a fire and and, uh, and that fire is still burning brightly. So, and ended up in the yep. US, got headhunted. <laughs> you know, ran through a whole different, a lot of different opportunities in the UK, got approached, uh, got connected with a, a couple of people, um, who uh, reached out and said, um, look, we, there's this opportunity in the US, a uh, good friend of the owners uh, of Midtown, the family that owned Midtown, it's family owned, uh, needed some support and some help. And um, and I was put in contact with them uh, through mutual uh, connections. And they, uh, and they flew me out here and I agreed to come out from the UK for three to five years max, I'd do a five year stint and help uh, transition the company and, and and move it into a more of a premium upscale uh, business. And then um, 
it's been here nearly nearly eleven years now. So uh, <laughs> so that we're, we're part we're on the second part of that uh, other side of it. So, uh, what are the biggest challenges you have faced to become this uh, premium level? Um, the biggest challenges, I think. Um, I mean, there are lots of cultural differences, actually, interestingly enough, um, in terms of how people view what uh, premium or what luxury is and what it, what uh, expectations are from people in different parts of the world. Interestingly enough, uh, I ran uh, a high-end premium um, health club and spa business in Europe across multiple countries, uh, Italy, Germany, Belgium, um, Spain, UK, and, and, and it was all slightly different. Um, but the U.S. is actually even more, uh, even more different than than those those European type countries in terms of what people expect uh, in terms of service service levels um, and how people are interacting with the staff. Um, you know, there's a there's a it's a very different ethos at the at the high end of the market here than it is in in Europe. In Europe, it's a little less. I mean, there's a there's obviously status and things that go along with um, premium luxury purchases in Europe, just as there are in the US. But here, it's um, there's a little more. You know, I'm not afraid to show you that I'm the customer. I'm not, I'm not afraid to show you that I'm paying your salary. If I've heard that once, I've heard it a hundred times here, but you never hear that in Europe. No one ever says that. It's, it's almost it's implied. Here, you know, it's much more in your face. But do you feel like when you're, in terms of like your competition, do you feel like you compete also against like lower end gyms? Because I think that there are like so many people like, oh, like, I don't want to spend that much on a gym. It's not worth it for me. But like, you know, it's de it's definitely worth it. But it's like even getting people who have the money to like, you know, get that value and get them to spend money on something. Because like, they're you know, your health and fitness like, is your whole life, right? Like, it's so important right. for you. Like, how do you get to like understand that purchase? Yeah, well, we, we, we part of it is a, a mindset within the, the, the teams. You know, your marketing team and your sales team, your front, your front line staff, your, your coaches and um, reception teams, housekeeping teams. And, and part of it is like, okay, we're worth it. You've got to, you people have to believe that it's worth the money um, and you've got to teach people that you're not shopping with your own wallet so you're not buying this is you know we're providing a service for um, a, a section of the community that has a different size wallet than we do you know and I we, we talk about that all the time and say what's valuable to us at what you know our size of wallet is different to what's valuable to them um, you know, I couldn't justify um, buying a, a big yacht and having it in the, the lake out here because you can only use it three months of the year because the rest of the time it's like too cold or it's icy. Um, but lots of people can justify that. Okay, good for them. That's great. I'm happy for them. And and and, and so you have to teach people that that's okay. It's just, you know, everyone's different. Everyone's a different situation. Um, and this is valuable to people. Your health is valuable and your community around that is valuable and your time is valuable. And we make that worthwhile by um, combining lots of different services and products um, and delivering a really high level of one-to-one -one interact and interactions and, and service across multiple areas of a business, tennis, aquatics, swimming, community, food and beverage, golf, whatever it might be, um, we provide those services. But it's not easy okay. and it's not for everyone. You have to just accept that. You say, if you, I can't afford it. We're like, okay, that's great. No problem. There's a club just down the street, which is like 50 bucks, 60 bucks, 100 bucks. You go and go and join that club. That's great. And But please go and join them because we, and we teach our people, we actually want people active. Our, like if you get into this industry and you're passionate about it, which is what we try to, we try to recruit people like that is because you want people to be, you're passionate about helping others and you want people to be better versions of themselves. And you can do that through exercise and movement and social activity. Um, and it affects not just your physical health, health, but also your mental health. So we're like, look, you know, that's great. No problem. But can I, here, let me organize an appointment for you at the club down the road. It's like Planet Fitness is 10 bucks a month. Go, go for it. You know, we'd encourage you to do that. So, which people find very, 
unusual. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, I always learn something from uh, from every podcast. And you know what I'm learning from you right now is uh, a boat is never de designed to park on the deck. This is, <laughs> this right. is something to this is something to float on the on the waves. Yeah, <laughs> face the exactly. waves. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so I'm going going a bit off the topic. So, uh, what do you think your technology uh, support? How how your technology supported your business? What is the role of of the technology in your business right now? Yeah, Te technology plays a huge part in what we do. Um, and it's growing all the time. It's not. It's not going. It's not going away. It's not going down. Um, we have recently invested. I think in the last four years, um, five, six, seven million dollars in um, upgrading our legacy technology platforms, uh, building out our, our technology team at our corporate office, um, so that we can. Um, collect and aggregate our own data effectively and efficiently. We've built out a data um, lake house, uh, which is, I'm sure you guys know, a combination of a, a data lake and a data warehouse where we combine the data bricks, we make sure that the data is structured um, in a way that we can then communicate with members uh, and nudge them in a direction that we, would, we, we think is helpful for them on an individual basis. So, um, you know, we want people to access all parts of the club. We want people to not just come in and lift weights or run on a treadmill. Uh, we want people to uh, take swimming lessons or take golf lessons or buy, rent a tennis court and you do some tennis programming, have their kids involved in kids' parties and kids' events, eat at the restaurant, use the spa, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because for us, we've... With the data we have, we track our, our members' length of stay really closely and our retention really closely. We found out that by having people be engaged in different parts of the club makes them more sticky and it, it extends their length of membership. And for us, you know, the biggest value that we get and the biggest um, profit that we have is through increasing the length of the time members with us because it's our dues value because it's so high uh, that drives the profitability of the business not the secondary revenue that we you know through the food and beverage or the spa or the shop or you know whatever you might want to do but that but those purchases create connection and they create um, a desire to continue your lifestyle expand your lifestyle at the club and that's the real value for us so we've been building out our technology platforms to enable us to gather that data seamlessly um, to then layer it and structure it um, efficiently and then use it to um, to push members to you know into different directions and also intervene when we see um, key metrics like um, usage change so we're into behavior trying to manage behavior change because uh, exercise is not easy for everyone and it, you know, if you want to get results, everyone says they want to get results. And I, you know, I want to get results in 30 days. I want to lose 10, 20 pounds in 30 days. And otherwise it's not worth it. You're like, okay, well, that's never going to happen. So not unless you just stop eating. Um, so we have to help you get real and understand what that really looks like. Uh, and we can best do that by communicating with people when we see them dropping off or when we see them starting to deviate from what we know is a really consistent um utilization um track so that's how we use that's what we want to do with our data um is it enhance the member experience that way so when you see somebody not showing up as much like what actions do you usually take to give them a call text message email like what is the best like step to get somebody to come back to the gym or see what's going on it depends on um it depends on what they've been doing in the past so historically so the last couple of last two or three years we have picked up the phone to them or we have emailed them or texted them or we've tried multiple channels to communicate with them um and we've used the person that they've last interacted with so if you bought a smoothie it was the last thing you did and you haven't been in in three weeks either the smoothie was terrible 
<laughs> um, or the person who interacted with you was awful, uh, or something else has happened. But what we've what we've done is we've identified that person and who made the smoothie, who just served you the smoothie, and said, "Okay, you need to call Dan. He's not been in three weeks. You were the last person he spoke with. I don't know what you said to him, but we need to see, figure out what's going on and how we can get Dan back in, even if if it's by offering him another smoothie." You know, like, let's figure out a way that, that something's going on. And what we found was that it had a huge positive impact on people. They were getting a phone call from, not from a salesperson or from the, anyone, you know, a senior manager or anyone, but the person who, oh, look, I remember making you that green machine smoothie. Was it really bad? We haven't seen it in three weeks. Was it really bad? Was it that bad? To, you know, was it, I mean, I need to know what's going on. But, oh no, I've been away on vacation for two weeks and I've sort of got out of the habit. I I meant to come in last week, but I just haven't had time. And but I'm gonna come in tomorrow, or I'm gonna come in on Wednesday, whatever the day is. I'm gonna come in this week. And I'm like, okay, so I'll be looking out for you and I'm gonna have a smoothie ready for you. So you just tell me what day it is. And if it's gonna be Wednesday at five, I'm gonna be here and we're gonna have a smoothie with your name on it ready to go. So come up to the counter and look for me because I'm I'm gonna look it out for you. Things like that have a real personal connection for people. And we found that that was a really key way of um, interacting with people and getting them back into the club and getting them to re-engage. The difficulty with that is you, it's very hard to do at scale. And so now we're looking at, you know, we, we did it for a couple of years, somewhat successfully in some clubs, less successfully in others. And so now it's like, okay, well, we need to automate this and we need to look at, uh, visit frequency what did they do same concept but like let's communicate with them either with a um, an AI slash machine learning algorithm that is going to create a communication that's personalized to you based on what you last did same concept uh, and sign it from the person that you last saw but we will do that in an automated fashion and we'll send it via text and email and then see what response we get and then we'll measure whether or not we need to add a phone call into that as well. So it's, and when we're, we're not quite at the rollout stage of that yet, but that's what we've been building over the last year and a half, two years um, in the, on the back end. That's exciting. So, and you're talking about AI and machine learning. So I guess like what other trends in technology are you looking at? Are you seeing in this space that you think can really help the company scale even more in the next few years? Um, so I think that's a really key one because retention and, and utilization is really critical to length of stay and length of stay is what drives profitability, uh, that and pricing. Um, we're using AI and pricing model modeling. So when we look at new clubs and new opportunities, we're looking at using it and saying, okay, let's go to market with and, and do some surveying and let's use the an AI tool to measure um, responses from people um, based on different price points. And because we can automate that and we can do it really quickly, um, it, we can do lots and lots of AB type testing in a market. And we can also do it with our own members and existing clubs too. So we can go to people and say, look, the price is gonna go up. We're gonna, we're gonna do this or this. Um, and we're not guaranteeing it's gonna be X or Y, but if we did this, what do you think? Or if we did this, what would you think? And then we can measure that based on responses and we can then filter it through um, through speech recognition um, analytics as well. So it can look at the tone of voice in terms of the, the message and, and, and get, a, get a weighted average of what the general feel for that change would be. Um, you know, nobody wants their price to go up, but if it's going to go up anyway, it's going to go up one way or the other. You know, maybe there's some uh, some some insights for that for us. Um, I would say the other thing we're doing with the with AI uh, and machine learning is really looking at how um, we can provide coaching to people um, in a with with equipment or in a, in a not to replace a personal trainer because I don't think you we not for us we wouldn't want to do that replace a, the, that personal touch um, we're very much a high touch um, organization but I think if we looked at how can you su be supported by a virtual coach when you're not with your personal trainer maybe you see a personal trainer once a week but we can create a virtual coach based on 
um, uh, information that we input from your trainer on your last session that's going to be a follow-up for the next session. So things like that we're looking into um, and how we can do that. Uh, but really there's lots and lots of um, opportunities, I think, in the in the industry to utilize that sort of technology. That's really cool. So I guess like when it comes to new business, you know, what do you look for in terms of locations to open up more clubs? I know obviously Lifetime sure is one of your big competitors. I mean, they're pretty big in this kind of luxury fitness space. Like, what do you look for? And how do you differentiate yourself? Say, hey, maybe like they have this market. Can I go in here? Like, what are what are what trends like are you looking at? Yeah, I think so. Um, no, we don't. I mean, we tend to, we compete with Lifetime in a couple of our markets, but not everywhere. Um, but they're for sure one of the the bigger operators in the in the whole fitness space. Um, we look for um, demographic. We do a lot of demographic research. So we look at demographic research and density. So for us, at our price point, which is um, significantly higher than Lifetime's, we need uh, a really good demographic and a, and a reasonably good density as well. Um, we look at suburban and urban uh, locations, depending on, and we have a whole um, consulting team that works with us to look at areas around the country that might match up demographics to either one of our urban our urban club here in Chicago or some of our suburban clubs around the country. We have some, we have clubs in Rochester, New York, Atlanta, um, uh, South Florida. And so looking at, is this is a location similar to this one that we already have. We know that performs well. Yeah. X, Y, Z. So, and then we, then we, this is a matter of looking at land availability because our clubs are big. You know, they take up a lot of real estate. That makes sense. So I guess, what are the goals for Midtown in the next three to five years? I mean, like, do you have a certain projection for like how many clubs you guys are planning to open or you think in the next 10 years? Yeah, we don't really, go, we don't really look at it like that. So um, we, our aim is not to be the biggest. It's just to be the best. So we don't want to be the biggest, we just want to be the best. And so for us, it's about looking at opportunities. Is is there an opportunity to go in here? Does that meet our brand standard? Can we deliver an, you know, uh, a, an exceptional level of service um, at, at, a, at a price point that would match our um, our model? Uh, you know, we, we have, I think we have, I'm pretty sure we have the highest payroll percentage of any company in our industry. Uh, and because we heavily invest in our people, uh, because we want to deliver an exceptional service, that our payroll percentage is, is high. Um, but we need to model that out in terms of new club growth. Um, I'd like to think we would have in the next five years another two or three clubs. Um performing at a very high level um but you know it takes it can take two years to build a club of this size and the club that i'm sitting in today is um over six hundred and seventy five thousand square feet um it, it's a huge building uh, a lot of um you know a lot of real estate uh, a lot of capital investment as well so you know um we just need to be mindful of the, the time it takes to go from finding a location to actually opening a location is uh, can be quite some time. It's not, we're not looking to open one on every corner. That's for sure. <laughs> that's good. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, here uh, I'm from Pakistan and here um, there's a saying, uh, if a peacock uh, dances in the jungle, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. So this is, this is a simple saying over there, like our forefathers probably used to say this. So uh, it did I believe, in fact, as an entrepreneur, I believe this thing fits on all the entrepreneurs as well. I have seen like there are many entrepreneurs who, who are in the market and they are on top as well. Like they are doing well, they're, they're, they're doing great. But sometimes they are reluctant about technology, but I can see you are also using a Hub HubSpot for your system, which is yep. um, like, like that was amazing for me. Like this is good <laughs> to adapt yep. something to give 
a value to yourself to your business so uh, by the way this is this is something good uh, i i liked it so that this is my personal thinking that if we are spending on technology wisely this gives you in return a lot so yeah i i i believe you have a good eye on it and uh, you yeah you i i good. mean the investment we made in in hubspot was um ha has been phenomenal i mean the the return on that investment <laughs> is huge and i think it's only going to get better as we get better at using it you know as we learn inherently systematically how to use it and how to get more out of it um, mm -hmm. it will continue to have an increased input uh, impact for us you know one of the things that we are doing is pulling we, because we're such a big business um, and we have our departments are very I mean, very and we have software for our restaurant we have a like we have a restaurant in this club um, that runs full software full restaurant software we have a hotel here we, we run our own hotel we have hotel software we can't run them on outdated old member management systems that have existed for 30 years Obviously. we have specific software so pulling yeah. that in um, to hubspot allows us to then have a, a, a individualized view of each member it's almost like having a you won't remember this dan because you're a lot younger than me but having a rolodex of every individual member with all the details on them and every spend they've ever had and everything uh -huh. they've ever done in the club and whenever they've been in the club. Um, and so having that information within HubSpot allows us then to create personalized communication plans for people based on what they've done, where they, how long they've been with us, <clears throat> what part of the club they use. And we're starting to, we use RFID technology within our club sport um, checking in we have gate access um, for security reasons uh, but also to monitor in, you know, people coming in and out of the building um, and so we 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 monitor people when they check in we know when they buy something it's all a cashless club so you pay for everything using your RFID wristband um, and now we're looking at a technology uh, called ultra wideband uh, UWB mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to then track who goes mm -hmm. into what studio space because we're an all-inclusive type of yeah. resort type we're not an individual boutique studio yeah. we don't you you can walk into any studio and do, join any class we, we don't mind it's just have it first and first served um and we don't up to this point we don't know who's taking what class and so with ultra wideband we're able to utilize our existing rfid wristbands and technology add that shit to it uh, and then ha as you walk into a studio, there's a beacon above the door yeah. to recognize who you are and just clock it into the CRM so that we now know that you that that, that you like to do um, yoga, you like to do vinyasa yoga, and you like to do vinyasa yoga with Melanie on a Wednesday, you know? And so, um, and so for us, that's really valuable information because we want to be able to communicate to people about what they're interested in and what we think might be relative or relevant to that person based on what they do, not just some random, okay, you know, you've never played tennis in your life and you're not interested in tennis and we can see you've never looked at tennis. We're not going to send you any information on tennis. Um, but, you know, you go to the boxing studio um, and you do a boxing with, a, with an instructor who also teaches indoor cycling Maybe just because you're you like that instructor, you should know that they also teach indoor cycling, and it's a really good way of you know, you yeah. know your upper body strength and your lower body strength combining the two. Yeah. So yeah, indeed, indeed that that that's cool. I I really enjoyed this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to we're trying to make a better environment using technology to help support those aims and those goals of um, making this a a second a second place for people, you know, now that everyone's working from home or remotely or sometimes in an office, sometimes not, we're trying to make the club uh, your second place, not your third place. Yeah. By the way, uh, this is just a random wandering idea. Uh, please don't mind. In fact, uh, you can, many of the functionalities you can achieve from the mobile app as well. Like you, I, I believe you are using iBeacon as well. So iBeacons, you know, can interact with the mobile apps as well. So yeah. So, 
Well, we have a mobile app. <laughs> It's not <laughs> nice. in that format. It's not very good. Um, it's a bit clunky, uh-huh. and uh, we are in the pro. We're ju- we've just started the process of um, building a new mobile app. So uh, uh-huh. custom mobile app. So um, that which will be based on the information we have within HubSpot, um, mm-hmm. using that as a as a base case, a base point to then drive those nudge nudge behavior. Um, uh-huh push people into different areas and encourage people to use different parts of the club and obviously provide um, increased booking and reservation information and tips and tricks and virtual coaching built within that as well. So, um, but that's probably 12 months away from being rolled out. It's a fairly major project Uh for us. So that's really cool. And then just to wrap it up. So I guess, John, what advice do you have for someone that is young that wants to be a CEO of a large company like yourself right on one day, like you obviously, you know, work very hard to get to where you are. Like what, what should somebody be looking for in terms of just structure, even like daily habits, like one, I guess one big piece of basic advice that, that, that you have for someone. Um, I, th- I think uh, if I could tell my younger self anything, it would, um, and, and, and from a very young age, I always had the uh, attitude that, Never turn anything down. Mm-hmm. You know, if you get an opportunity, make take take the opportunity. Someone is going to ask you to do something. Take the opportunity to do something, um, and do it to the best of your ability. Um, and don't be afraid to step into different areas and different um, industries and things like that, uh, because really, you know, things aren't that different. You know, nothing that we do, nothing that I do here is that different from what I did in, in terms of when I was teaching kids? Um, you know, you're trying to get the best out of people. You're trying to coach people and lead people. Um, you're trying to provide clarity about decision-making and you're trying to provide a structure where people can grow and learn and develop. It really isn't that different to education in lots of ways. Um, it's certainly not different from coaching or from running a professional sports team where you're trying to, you know, really develop and coach people up in their performance and build a team environment where people can work together. I I, I, I think the other thing is be vulnerable, be open. Um, don't be afraid to to say I need help or I'm mm-hmm. or I want to learn, you know, mm-hmm. and, and be curious, ask questions. Um, yes. I think everyone's afraid to ask questions because they feel it might make them look stupid or like they don't know something. But the, the the further on in my career I get, the more valuable people asking questions is because it might open a door for me to think in a different way as well. And it might create an opportunity for us to have a conversation about something that, you know, quite honestly, hadn't crossed my radar or I hadn't thought of. Um, or maybe it has and I get to explain it to somebody and 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 really go through my thought process which not only helps me but helps that person understand where i'm coming from as well so i would say be curious ask lots of questions be vulnerable be transparent about the fact that you might need help with stuff and don't be afraid to do that that's amazing well i learned a lot and i want to say thank you so much for your time today it was a really great podcast you're welcome you're welcome have a great day you guys thanks for having me on I appreciate yeah. it thanks john really enjoyed it all right enjoyed take care it. thank you right, bye Bye-bye. Bye-bye.